All right, welcome everybody to another IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich. Today's topic is available fault current and it starts now. All right. Welcome to another IEI News Live. We are going to have a great topic today. In my opinion, it's one of the most fundamental uh, studies or reviews of a power distribution system that you can do on a power system. And I think sometimes it's the, one of the most misunderstood, um, maybe one of those that uh, doesn't get done when it's supposed to be done, performed. And then once you perform this, um, and, and, and once you understand the available fault currents that are in a power distribution system, the next question is, what do you do with that information? So we're, gonna, we're, going, to, we're going to take a journey through uh, what fault current is. I'm going to try to convey what it is. Then we're going to look at um, how we calculate it, talk about some of the important parameters that you need to know. And um, I don't know, try to make sense of it. See how you use the information. I uh, do, before we get started in that, want to make, make sure everybody is aware we are in the section meeting season. So uh, as this is being, uh, this was pre-recorded. So this, I'm recording this right before the Eastern section meeting. And when this is airing, I will be at the Western Section meeting of the IAEI in Michigan. So um, hopefully I will see all of you at one of these section meetings. And if I'm not going to be there, it doesn't mean you can't still go and enjoy the company of all of the other professionals who are out there worried and wanting to learn more to increase safety in the electrical industry. So these are great opportunities to do that. So check those resources out. Also, don't forget to check out the IAEI's website and take advantage of the educational opportunities that are offered. There are a lot of online sessions that you can register for, attend, and I believe they're even given out some CEU credits and they're very inexpensive. Uh, for, for the quality of the program that you're getting and you're getting some CEU credits, uh, it is very well worth your time to take a look at that. So please don't forget, check out those resources online at IAEI.org. All right, now let's talk a little bit about uh, fault currents. I've, ha I've got some, some resources for us. My references are gonna be as follows. I have the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code, and we'll probably reference older versions of the National Electrical Code. I've got my Keith Laughlin special, special thinking pen. Don't go anywhere without it. I, if I don't have it, I can't think straight. Um, so I will be referencing the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code. I also will probably reference the 2021 version of 70E, and you know where you can get these and these documents. You can uh, definitely reach out and get the latest version of these documents. Um, what else? Oh, uh, and 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 so from for the power systems engineers out there, or the electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, anybody who is in the business of calculating fault currents, I've got a few other, a couple, a few other references for you. Um, the IEEE Red Book. Now, this is an older copy of the IEEE Red Book, the 1986 version. This was my first copy of the Red Book. I and and there have been updates to this book uh, since the 1986 version, obviously. But uh, great resource for you. The title of this is Electric Power Distribution for Industrial Plants, and. It's the recommended practice for electrical power distribution for industrial plants. And in this version, uh, you have, I'll just give you an overview of the contents of this. You have, you have the introduction, you have a system planning, talking about design considerations. This is where you get into voltages and all that good stuff. 
Uh, the next chapter is voltage considerations. Then you have, uh, nope, then, yeah, system planning, voltage considerations, surge voltage protection, application coordination, and system protective devices. And in here, you'll find uh, available fault current calculations, some good example of short circuit calculations. Short circuit analysis is in chapter two, system planning. And uh, so great reference for you. Another good reference is the, what they call the buff book from IEEE. It's another good reference, IEEE standard 242. Uh, this too is a 1986, my uh, first copy of this book. Uh, but this is a great book for if you're doing coordination and you're doing short circuit studies. And then I'm gonna go back in time uh, a really in, a reference, and this is it's green. That's why it's not showing up. But I've got a um, a uh, this is called the Industrial Power Systems Handbook. This is a, a copy of the first edition, which was 1955. But in here, there's some really good fundamental basic descriptions of what fault current and short circuit currents are. So I I may have some references to those documents somewhere. In our discussion today, I just want to just share that with you. Uh, and there are some really good programs on uh, any of the programs, especially the 2017 version did make a lot of changes around fault current and short circuit current ratings. So check out the 2017 code changes from the IAEI. Um, there, and remember, you'll, you'll be looking in chapter one, 110 and article 100. So you're going to want to check out those areas of the code changes uh, specifically for some of the key changes around understanding short circuit currents and equipment evaluations. So uh, in any case, um, those are just some of the uh, references that I, th I think you should uh, you should understand and be aware of. So let's t let's just dive into this thing we call fault current. And, and so I'm going to use various terms. I'm going to use, I'm going to use fault currents. I'm going to use short circuit currents. Um, and uh, I don't know. I don't believe there's a difference, but, uh, you know, I, it, let's just take a look at some terms and definitions. That's all. So what is fault current? Because I'm not going to get into uh I'm just gonna we, we got we're gonna follow the code. We're gonna follow the definitions that are in the National Electrical Code and uh, make sure that um, we understand those terms that are in there. So Article 100 is a great place to start. Chapter one of the National Electrical Code applies what? It applies generally. So if you go to in the 2020 code version uh, document, go to page 35. Eyes are getting bad. 35. Uh, what is fault current? And then there's, an, uh, there's two definitions in Article 100. You have fault current and you have available fault current. Now, let me, let me give you a little bit of a background. Those two terms are new for the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code. And where do we get those from? The 70E document is the first place that introduced the term fault current and available fault current. And I have, I have uh, the 2021 version of that document, and I'm just going to look, and there is fault current and fault current available. So these terms for the 70E document safe work practices wasn't new for the 2021 version it was new for the previous a version a version the previous version of uh 70e that's when they introduced these terms so it hit 70e first and then it was adopted and moved into and and i guess i guess you could call it adopted right it was uh it was put into the 2020 version of the national electrical code so let's take a look at these two terms. Now, now, okay, before we even get to the terminology, 30,000 foot view, what is fault current? Remember that, let's think about the definition of overcurrent. And I don't have, a, I don't have this in my slide deck, but if you have your code book, go to your 2020 version of the National Electrical Code, 
go to page drum roll please element o overcurrent go to page 38 if you go to page 38 of the uh, 2020 version of the National Electrical Code, and let's take a look at the definition of overcurrent. It says, any current in excess of the rated current of equipment for the or the opacity of a conductor, it may result from overload, short circuit, or ground fault. Now, let's talk about those three. An overload is not a fault current. Short circuit is a fault current. Ground fault is a ground is is a fault current. It's got the word fault in it. So the difference between a fault current and an overload, they're both over currents. Right? They're both overcurrents because they're all in that definition. We know they're going that these current values are going to exceed the rating of conductors or other equipment. The major difference between a short circuit and an overload is the overloads, an, an, an overload current stays in the path. Look at it that way. You know, it's like, it's like you have a two lane highway. You have uh, the right side of the road, depends upon what country you're in, uh, but the right side of the road where I'm from goes this way and the left side of the road goes this way. As long as all the cars stay in their lanes, if I have too many cars in one lane, I can have an overload. So if I pull too much current, if I pull current in excess of the rating of or the ampacity of a conductor based upon the conditions of use, it's ampacity, if I, if I am exceeding the ampacity of a conductor, but all of the current is staying in the path, all of the current is all the current going out is in the hot wire and everything coming back is in the neutral say on a single phase 120 volt system all my current is staying in that black conductor and coming back in the white conductor everything is in its path but i'm exceeding the ampacity of the conductor that is an overload the moment that a that a current goes outside of the normal path, that is when I have a short circuit. I could have a ground fault if it goes outside of the path and goes to ground. That's a ground fault. That's a short circuit current. I could have a short circuit that goes from line to line, line to neutral, line to ground. All of those are fault currents. So now, an overload, think about an overload. Think about what's going on. If I'm going to overload a circuit, good example of overloading a circuit. Let's talk about my garage. I turn on my table saw. My table saw pulls so many amps on a 20 amp circuit, and my table saw isn't plugged into a receptacle outlet. On that same receptacle outlet, I might have a vacuum, a shop vac, where I um, I take the hose and I plug it, I, I put it into uh, the portal that's on my uh, table saw so that it pulls the dust into the vacuum instead of let, just letting it fly into the air into my garage. So I turn on my table saw, I turn on the vacuum. Now maybe I want to have a, a little bit more light, so I plug in a shop light into that same 20 amp circuit. And then maybe I want some heat in my garage, so I plug a heater into that same 20 amp circuit. Now I could plug enough loads in to where I'm exceeding 20 amps, but I'm not hundreds of amps or thousands of amps. I'm exceeding 20 amps by maybe another five or six amps or maybe 10 amps depending upon what I'm plugging in. I am experiencing an overload, and depending upon the time current characteristic curve, which is another great topic for an IAEI News Live for another day, but if I'm the, the 
time current characteristic curve for the circuit breaker that's protecting my 20 amp circuit is going to determine how much time that it lets that overload exist. And it could be that I turn all of that on, cut my wood, turn it all off, and I never trip the breaker. That's a temporary overload. So overcurrent devices can permit temporary overloads, which don't damage the conductor, don't damage the receptacle, or anything else in that circuit, because the circuit breaker is set to trip and provide protection of the conductors from overloads, overheating, and it takes current and time to heat a conductor. And if I don't let the current flow for long enough, I'm not going to heat the conductor enough to melt the insulation. So I can take temporary overloads, let them exist, they'll go away. But if they don't go away, eventually you'll trip the overcurrent protective device, whether it be a circuit breaker or a fuse. Now, short circuit currents, when they go outside the path, that means that I have a load, I have conductors, I've shortened my circuit. I have current somewhere in between, somewhere in that circuit. I have created an alternative path to either ground or to neutral, directly to neutral, line to, you know, say a line to line fault or a line to neutral fault, line to ground fault somewhere outside of the normal path. If I go to straight to line to neutral, think about a, a 120 single, foot, single phase 20 amp circuit in your home. If I cut the conductor, I, if I have a 100 foot run of conductor and I go at 50 foot and I cause a direct short, short between line and neutral, now the normal path for current is to go out of the 100 foot and come back the 100 foot. But if I go fit at 50 foot and create a direct short from line to neutral, now my current goes out 50 foot to neutral and back. That is a short current, short circuit current. I've actually physically shortened the circuit. And what does that do? It removes impedance. I've removed the impedance of the load. And what, that, what has that done? When I reduce impedance, what happens to current in a circuit with a constant voltage? goes up and it goes up considerably so a fault current is an overcurrent because it is it is in the definition it's an overcurrent many times larger than normal operating current why because i have reduced the length of the circuit i have taken impedance out i've taken the impedance of the load out And because my impedance is much lower, my current, short circuit current will go much higher. It's outside of the path. Why is that important to know? It's important from a safety perspective. NFPA 70E, safe work practices. Understanding the difference between an overload and a short circuit. Think about this. What does 70E tell us and OSHA tell us about after a circuit breaker trips? Let's say that you have a fault in your system. You have, you have a circuit breaker in a plant, an industrial facility, and the breaker trips. Do you just reset it? Are you permitted to reset it? No. OSHA tells us you have to clear the fault first, then reset the overcurrent protective device. Now, before you reset the overcurrent protective device, you have to understand how much current did it see? Because if you take a circuit breaker and it experiences upwards close to its interrupting rating, you're probably going to want to take that circuit breaker out, evaluate its condition, before you put it back into service. You may want to take it out, replace it with a new one, take that breaker you took out, get it evaluated. There's, if you follow NEMA AB4, which is a free download off of the NEMA website, you can download that document and understand how to test a breaker or, or look at your NEDA standards, National Electrical Testing um, 
at NETA. NETA, what's the acronym? I want to make sure I get that right. NETA, NETA, N-E-T-A. NETA testing. National Electrical Testing Association. I want to make sure I did it the uh, get, got the A correct. Now, if you if you took it's an international uh, electrical testing association. So, NEDA will have give you some guidance. NEMA National uh, National Electrical Manufacturers Association. If you go to NEMA.org and search for NEMA AB four, AB and four. So let's let's do that real quick. NEMA. AB4. You go to NEMA AB4, Guidelines for Inspection and Preventative Maintenance of Molded Case Circuit Breakers Used in Commercial and Industrial Applications. So you download this and look, it's expensive. Zero dollars. Whoop, let's take that hard copy out of there. The electronic, you can download it for free from the NEMA website and use that to help you understand how to ascertain the condition. But the first chore you have, you have to figure out how about how much current. Now, if you determine during your evaluation, before you turn that breaker back on, that the fault was an overload because you were in your shop, you turned on the table saw, you turned on the fan, you turned on the, um, the shop vac, you turned on the heater, and all of a sudden, after a few seconds, the circuit breaker tripped. You sort of got that indication you know what the cause and effect was. You didn't have a short circuit. You, you shut all of that equipment off, and then you can reset your circuit breaker. But if you're sitting in the house or you're sitting in your industrial facility, all of a sudden a circuit breaker trips, and you say, okay, what was going on? I don't have that load. That I have that, that that's being added. Say it's a lighting circuit. I mean, it's a lighting circuit. You, you all your lights are on. They're always on. You never have an overload because you can't add anything else. You know it wasn't an overload. Now you have to find the short circuit. Clear that fault. And when you find that short circuit, you'll know if it was a ground fault, if it was a bolted fault. You'll figure out what that was. And if it was an actual fault current, you could, if you wanted to. Estimate, and we'll show you how to do this, estimate how much fault current would have flown, flown, would have been drawn to that problem. Flown. Did you ever see fault current fly? I haven't seen them fly. I've seen pigs fly. I'm mean, never fault current. But anyway, um, you can determine or estimate how much fault current was circulating in that current based upon where you find the fault after you've cleared it. And you'll, you can get an estimate of how much current that circuit breaker saw when it opened. Now, if you have a circuit breaker that has, say, an electronic trip unit in it, maybe it is communicating with a computer, you could actually capture the waveform. Depending upon the technology in the circuit breaker, which will probably be dictated by the size and the type of circuit breaker that you're dealing with it could be a, if it's a it could still could be a molded case circuit breaker, but your insulated case and your power circuit breakers will typically have electronic trip units that have a lot more functionality than probably what you know. Uh, and some manufacturers are coming out with uh, circuit breakers that have uh, health indication on them, so that you know about approximately how much fault current it it interrupted, whether it was a short circuit, ground fault, if it was a overload. So you need to ascertain why the, the fault occurred and knowing whether or not, what knowing, um, knowing approximately, like if the circuit breaker can tell you it was an overload, then you sort of know how much current it was drawing be because an overload is probably not going to be in the magnitudes of short circuit current, unless you've got a big issue going on. But in any case, Overloads aren't going to be in those magnitudes. Short circuit current is going to be very high. You Electrical safety will depend upon you trying to figure out and estimate that. So that's why another reason why this session today is important, not just from uh, making sure uh, circuit breakers and fuses and equipment have the right ratings, but also for the electrical worker to make sure they 
Stay safe. All right. So you need to understand that difference between overload, short circuit, ground faults. All right. Let's move on. Fault current, Article 100, NEC 2020, which again, remember, it started in 70E. The, the, the definition is exactly the same. And a, well, let's take a look at that. I'm going to grab uh, 70E and see if it is exactly the same. Fault current. Okay, so this is fault current, Article 100 of 2020. I'm going to read what's in 70E. And all of you can take a look at this and say, is it the same? 70E says, fault current, the amount of current delivered at a point on the system during a short circuit condition. Ooh, look, it's a little bit different. Article 100 of the National Electrical Code calls it an objectionable current that flows due to an abnormal circuit condition. Interesting. There's a little bit of a difference. And, and now this definition was put in because the correlating committee created a task force or task group to take a look at the use of the term short circuit current. Now, everywhere in the National Electrical Code, uh, we always say um, you know, the maximum available fault current, the maximum short circuit current, et cetera. So the first thing this task group needed to do was define a fault current. And this was the language that they came up with. And that is what's in the National Electrical Code. It was influenced by the changes in 70E, but it is not identical to what is in 70E. All right, so available fault current is another defined term. And I'm going to read to you what it says in 70E, and you can watch this, which is what's in the National Electrical Code. 70E says, the largest amount of current capable of being delivered at a point on the system during a short circuit condition. The largest amount of current capable of being delivered at a point on the system during a short circuit condition. So it looks like it is verbatim. And I would argue that maybe the, the follow the style manual requirements, that definition should show that it, it is extracted text. I don't know. David Williams, if you're out there, buddy, check into that. Uh, this is, I believe, a panel 10 definition. Yes, it is. CMP 10. Look at that. All right. So the largest amount of current capable being delivered at a point on the system during a short circuit condition that's an important uh, thing to know. And, and they even give us a diagram. Let's take a look at the diagram. And the diagrams are identical between the two versions. <clears throat> Just gonna take a look real quick. Yep, 70E and the National Electrical Code have the same diagram as well. So the source is AC or DC. It doesn't matter if it's uh, AC or DC. And, and you'll look at the points like for an overcurrent protective device, what they tell us is that you should evaluate, say, the interrupting rating of an overcurrent protective device with regard to its available fault current. And look, the available fault current is on the line side. Let's take a look at the uh, in 110, and I believe the section of reference is 110.9. I believe it's 110.9. We're going to double check my numbers. Yes, 110.9 is interrupting rating. Equipment intended to interrupt current at fault levels shall have an interrupting rating at nominal circuit voltage at least equal to the current that is available at the line terminals of the equipment. So the available fault current in this diagram, it's this one. Whoop, it's that one right there because that's at the line terminals of the equipment. So, uh, and, and then why do we do that? Because you want the maximum available fault current. You don't wanna go downstream, you wanna be at that equipment. And that will tell you the interrupting rating. Short circuit current rating is very similar. So, uh, so the latest, the, the changes in the 2020 cycle were basically looking at, they wanted to create a term. Now it says, remember what the definition says, 
the largest amount of current capable being delivered. So we know it's the largest amount. So throughout the National Electrical Code, we used to say to, you know what? I don't have my other code book. I think I probably have it on. I do have it here. So let's take a look. I want to, I am going to, let me show you something. I'm going to take a look at the 17 code language real quick. Or for, uh, uh, for 110.9. And, and I think that will help you understand one of the changes and the impact in the National Electrical Code. So here is what uh, 110.9 used to say. Equipment intended to interrupt current at fault levels shall have an interrupting rating at nominal circuit voltage at least equal to the current that is available at the line terminals of the equipment. Equipment intended to interrupt current at other than fault levels shall have an interrupting rating at nominal circuit voltage at least equal to the current that must be interrupted. That didn't have the maximum number in there that I thought was in there. That's not a good... Um, because what well, let me let me just find here. Let me find a good reference section. Here we go. Uh, 110.24. What am I talking about? Yeah, 110.24 is a good example. Now, now why is 110.9? Why didn't we see the word maximum in there? Just remember what 110.9 tells us. An interrupting rating for a device may not be associated with an available fault current. I might have an interrupting rating because that piece of equipment is only intended to, say, interrupt load currents. So I'll have a maximum interrupting rating of, say, a, a contact of, of some sort that it doesn't have an interrupting rating from fault current, but it does have the, gives you the maximum amount of current that it can stop from flowing, which is not a fault current. So 110.24 in the National Electrical Code is directly related to available fault current. Why? How do we know that? What's the title of 110.24? Available fault current. Now, what it says, it says available fault current marking service equipment at other than dwelling units, shall be legibly marked in the field with the maximum available fault current. That's in the 17 code. Let's take a look at 110.24 in the 2020 code. 110.24 says, service equipment at other than dwelling units shall be legibly marked in the field with the available fault current. So they got rid of the word maximum from 110.24. Why did they do that? Because it's right here in the definition of available fault current. So all I need to do is say available fault current, and I already know it is the maximum available fault current, the largest amount of current capable of being delivered at a point because it is in the definition. So that's, that's I mean, it seems like a simple change. It seems like a no-brainer change. Um, but it's an important detail to remember. But the, the other really interesting part about it is about this topic is that interrupting rating does not necessarily mean the maximum available fault current. An interrupting rating could be something other than fault current. That is a maximum amount of current that a component can stop from flowing. So anyway, why do we care about short circuit currents? Well. Short circuit currents that go outside of the path, they went outside of the path for a reason. Not just because they took a detour and it was uh, lunchtime and they said, hey, we're going to go park it over here. No, they went outside of the path because either a wrench got dropped, um, something happened to disrupt that current and, room, and give it a path to some other location. Something bad, probably. You have magnetic forces. You have arc flash, incident energy. You have heat. Um, you, have, uh, you have an explosion. You have what we call an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. You want to know that when a short circuit current is flowing, that the equipment that is going to stop the flow of that current 
can do so. You want to make sure that the current that has to carry and deliver the current, what the equipment that has to deliver that current to wherever it's going, for as long as it will be permitted to flow by the overcurrent protective device, holds it together under the pressures of the magnetic forces of that current. So if I have an industrial control panel that's delivering fold current, if I have busway that is delivering that current for say two, three cycles, based upon the clearing time of the overcurrent protective device, the equipment has to hold it together under the pressures of those magnetic forces. So I need to calculate this. This is the most fundamental calculation that you can perform on a power distribution system. And it's important for us to understand it. This is a video of what happens when you exceed the short circuit current rating. Now, just help me, I just wanna help you understand. Short circuit current rating is not the ability of a device to stop the flow of current. Circuit breakers and fuses do not have a short circuit current rating. Equipment has a short circuit current rating. You see this right here? That's a little, that's the conductors coming out of this equipment and it's shorted together. So inside this box includes components that must carry and deliver the fault current to this problem right here, short circuit. I have two conductors, I tied the hot and neutral together, and I am going to let, and I know the fault current passing through this is gonna be 35,000 amps, but it's only rated for 5,000 amps. You are going to see damage because I am misapplying this product. I'm violating 110.10 of the National Electrical Code. Let's see what happens. Looks like my shirt after a good Thanksgiving dinner. That latch just about gave way. Look at how this steel is bent. That is a lot of force going on inside this enclosure. Now we're going to up the ante here. We're gonna increase that fault current with the same rated equipment. This is still a 5,000 amp short circuit current rated equipment. I'm gonna let 65,000 amps pass through this, this uh, piece of equipment. Whoa. So when you exceed the ratings of equipment, that door went about 25 feet in the lab. That is a severe misapplication of this equipment. Now this is a fuse. This is a fuse that was severely misapplied. It's only a 10,000 amp interruption this rating. This is a serious misapplication. And I let 50, I tried to stop the flow of 50,000 amps with a device that's only rated to stop the flow of 10,000 amps. This is an interrupting rating, not a short circuit current rating. That fuse was supposed to stop the flow of current, but it's only rated to stop the flow of 10,000 amps, not 50,000. Now let's take a look at what is, uh, let's take a look at a misapplied circuit breaker. The interrupting rating is only 14,000 amps. With a 50,000 amps, it tried to stop the flow of 50,000 amps. This is what? This is... Again, this, this is, is a serious, serious misapplication. misapplication. That's right. 
So misapplication, when you misapply a product in the field, you get an unintended rapid disassembly, or you could get an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. It would be bad. It would be bad. So calculating that fault current is one of the most fundamental studies. And if you're doing nothing else with that data, you at least have to make sure that all of the products are rated to handle that current, either an interrupting rating if it's a fuse or a circuit breaker, or a short circuit current rating if it is a piece of equipment like a busway, panel boards, switch boards, switch gear, um, conductors, receptacles, anything that is going to deliver the current will have a short circuit current rating. You want to hold, you want it to hold together and not explode. Or if it doesn't explode, doesn't have to explode. You could pull the con, you could pull the conductors out. You could just damage it enough that eventually it will fail miserably. All right, now in the National Electrical Code, there are many places where you have, now this is the marking of the short circuit current rating. So here's the recipe. I'm just gonna give you a recipe for success. First, you need to know the available fault current. Next, you need to know the rating. And next, you need to compare the two. The short circuit current rating always has to be greater than the available fault current. So this is the this is everywhere in the code where you have a marking requirement for short circuit current rating on the equipment. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the short how how equipment is rated and how it's labeled. This is these are the sections of the code where you either have a marking or a documentation requirement of available short circuit current of that equipment. So like in 110.24 and we read it earlier. What does 110.24 tell us? I'm going to read it again for you. 110.20E4. One ten dot twenty four available fault current service equipment and other than dwelling units shall be legibly marked in the field with the available fault current. Why in the field? Fault current is dependent upon a lot of different parameters that I don't know when when that nobody knows, no manufacturer knows when that product ships. We can't. The manufacturer cannot label available fault current on equipment because they don't know where it's going to be installed. So it says in the field. So 110.24 tells us on service entrance equipment under certain certain you know service entrance equipment. Um, 408.6 panel board switchboards and switch gear. 409 industrial control panels. 440 air conditioning and refrigeration. 620 elevator control panels. 670 industrial machinery. Now this is these are the sections of the code that tell you the SCCR rating must be greater than the available short circuit current. 110.10 is our reference for that for any application. They also added that similar language, specific language in 409 for industrial control panels, 440 for air conditioning, for six, in 620 for elevator control panels, and 670. Why would we add it in these other locations when it's already really technically in 110.10? Because it's not getting done. People are missing it. They're not thinking about it. So we put that language in these other areas and other sections of the code so that we want to raise the awareness. You've got to make sure this equipment is applied correctly. Why? Because of those videos I showed you. When you exceed the short circuit current rating of equipment, it's ungood. Now, here's just a you know walk through uh, those, those uh, different areas of the code. Service entrance equipment. You have to have SCCR marked on the equipment, the SCCR rating of the equipment. If you get and purchase and install listed equipment, the UL standards tell you you have to mark those, those solutions. Now, panel boards, switch boards, and switch gears. Panel boards, let's talk panel boards real quick because this will give you a little understanding. Panel boards don't mark the short circuit current rating on the equipment. I know you're probably sitting there going, Tom has gone nuts. He's crazy. But let me get, help me, let me help you understand my philosophy here. What a panel board is marked with is the recipe to determine 
the short circuit current rating of that equipment because it doesn't say the short circuit current rating of this equipment is 65k 100k or 200k it what what you will typically see on a panel board is that the short circuit current rating of that equipment is based upon the lowest interrupting rating device that's installed inside so if i put all 65k circuit breakers in a panel board it is a 65K short circuit current rating. If I take one of those breakers out, or let's say I'm going to add a circuit to that panel board, and I go to the supply house, I say, hey, I need a, I need a 60 amp uh, three pole breaker to fit in a XYZ manufacturer catalog number LMNOP panel board. Do you think the supply house is gonna give you a 65K breaker when they can give you a 10K breaker? I highly doubt it. Unless you say, oh, and by the way, I need a 65K breaker because the short circuit current rating of this equipment has to be 65,000 amps. Then they'll give you that rating. But if you put a 10K breaker in that panel board, it becomes a 10,000 amp short circuit current rating for the entire panel board. One weak link can hurt you. So be mindful of how you, when you replace overcurrent devices inside of a panel board. 110.24 tells us we need to mark and document the available, maximum available fault current or the available fault current. And then the rating maximum uh, SCCR of that equipment, 110.10. Now, uh, 408 in the 2020 version did add... 408, if it's a panel board, switchboard, or switch gear, uh, I gotta just find it. I should, have the, I should have put the reference up there, but I did not. Look at that, it's like, it's like it automatically opened there. 408.6, it says switchboard, switch gear, and panel boards shall have a short circuit current rating, not less than the available fault current. In other than one and two family dwelling units, the available fault current and the date the calculation was performed shall be field marked on the enclosure at the point of supply. The marking shall comply with 110.21b. So I need to mark the available fault current uh, based upon 110.24 if it's a service entrance equipment, but if it's not service entrance equipment, I still have to mark it based on 408.6. Check it out. It's new for the 2020 code. Industrial control panels. Article 409 tells us 410, 409.110.4 tells us we need to mark the SCCR. But if you buy a listed UL5088 panel, it will have the short circuit current rating because it's required by the listing. The maximum available fault current has to be documented, not marked on the equipment, but documented as per 409.22b. And you have to make sure the short circuit current rating is greater than the maximum fault current, and that's because of 110.10, but also because of 409.22a. Take a look at motor, motor circuits and controllers. Now you need to document the available fault current. The short circuit current rating, if it's listed, if it's a listed motor control center, or a motor circuit controller, whatever, it's an UL845, you're going to require to mark the short circuit current rating on that equipment based upon the, the listing, but also because of 430.98. The maximum available fault current has to be documented based on 430.99. And the SCCR needs to be uh, greater than or equal to the maximum available fault current, and that's based on 110.10. Air conditioning and refrigeration equipment. The SCCR has to be marked on the equipment based on NEC 440.4B, but if you buy a listed 19, UL1995 product or a UL508A product, it will be, it, the SCCR is required to be on the label because it's required by the listing. So this is why many inspectors will simply look for the listing. If it's listed, that data has got to be there. The maximum available fault current has to be marked or documented as per 440.10b and available to the authority having jurisdiction. Let's just take a look at 440. Since we're here, 
Let's read 440.10b. And I know that you have all opened your book to page 336. 440.10 is titled Short Circuit Current Rating, and B is Documentation. When motor controllers or industrial control panels of multimotor and combination load equipment are required to be marked with a short circuit current rating, the available fault current and the date the available fault current calculation was performed shall be documented and made available to those authorized to inspect, install, or maintain the installation. Love this stuff. And based on 110.10 and 440.10a, which I just read. No, I didn't. 440.10a says motor controllers of industrial control panels or multimotor and combination load equipment shall not be installed where the available fault current exceeds its short circuit current rating as marked in accordance with 440.4b. It's a cake. Elevators, dumbwaiters, escalators, moving walks, platform lifts, and stairway chair lifts. You have to have the SCCR marked on the equipment. UL 508A, if you buy a listed product, it's like Anna Marie Albighetti. It's in there. NEC 620.16A needs to be marked. Maximum available fault current, fault current needs to be marked on the equipment. Why does it this need to be marked on the equipment, but the other one didn't? Two different code panels. That's all. Two different groups of people had two different philosophies. One code panel said, we want to mark it in the field. Another code panel said, we just want it documented. I wish everybody would be consistent, but, they're, but it's okay to each his own. And that's in 620.51D as in David 2. And then SCCR greater than maximum fault current, 110.10 always applies, but it's also in 620.16D. And I'll tell you where, where, where one place for elevator control panels, especially where you got to be mindful, you're in it like New York City, downtown secondary network, New York City, Seattle, Washington, Boston, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, any place where there's a secondary network in a downtown location, fault currents at the bottom of the building, typically very high. And in many of those tall buildings, what are they employed to get current from the bottom of the building to the top? They employ a busway. You know what a busway is? a high efficiency fault deliverable system. The fault current at the top of that building can be quite high. And in many cases, it's hard to find, say an elevator control panel listed greater than 10K. They'll tell you to lower the fault current. How do I lower fault current? One-to-one -one transformer. That really complicates things. You better have tap changers on that. You better have the room on the roof. Think about it. Industrial machinery, 670.3A4, NFPA 79. Those are places where you're required to write, mark the SCCR rating or if you buy a listed product. Maximum available fault current has to be marked on industrial machinery, 670.5 uh, per N2. And then the, you have to compare the two numbers based on 110.10 again, always, and 670.5 per N1. How about air HVAC equipment, air conditioning and refrigeration equipment? Um, if, if you buy listed equipment again, right? Or 700.5E, 701, 702, 708. No, this isn't HVAC. This is transfer switch equipment. I got the title of this incorrect. Let's fix that. We can, we can fix this stuff on the fly. You know why? Because that's how good we are. Automatic transfer switches. Let's get this right. Article 700, 701, 702, and 708. UL 1008, UL 67, UL 98. All of these, if they're a listed product, the SCCR is required to be on there based on the sections of the code. But if you buy a listed product, they're required to be on there based upon the standard. There's no requirement to either document or mark the maximum available fault current on any of that equipment. And as per 110.10, you always have to make sure that the rating exceeds the available fault current. And in many cases on the automatic transfer switch, you gotta be careful because they call that a cl withstand close on rating. They're, they're, they're the same, uh, same thing, basically. I mean, not technically, but basically. <laughs> All right, tools. 
The one line diagram, the number one tool that you need to make sure you have the latest single line diagram. You, the, the single line diagram has a lot of information and it is critical for electrical safety. It's critical for the electrical, for safe work practices, for 70E, lockout tagout. How do you do lockout tagout without an accurate one line diagram? Help me. Short circuit current uh, calculations, I need it for coordination studies, load flow studies, safety evaluations, lockout tagout programs. Any engineering study that you're going to do is going to need a one line diagram. Accurate, up to date, available. Three key things accurate, up to date, available, and uh, efficient and, and maintenance. It has all of the information you need. You should have the available fault current numbers on there. You need the um, you need the length of conductors, the size of your transformers, the impedance of the transformers, KVA of the transformers. It'll tell you if it's a delta, Y grounded system, Y, Y system. You need to know that information. You need to know the motors. How big are the motors? What's the horsepower rating of the motors? If you have an X to R ratio of the motor, a percent impedance of motors for large motors, you need to know as much information as you can put on a one line diagram, the better off you are. That information is going to go in to calculating fault currents. Now, we don't consider impedance of bus like it's in a panel board or the impedance of a fuse or a circuit breaker. We look at the big components of impedance, transformer impedances, conductor impedances, uh, busway impedances, motor impedances, generator impedances. What else? Inductors, if you have an inductance, an inductor in there. Line reactors is what I mean, a line reactor. Uh, we, we don't model the impedance of bus inside of a panel board or switchboard. That, that big copper, we, we, we don't need to do that. The, the impedance is insignificant uh, on the overall picture. Um, uh, important to know, a transformer does not generate power uh, fault current. The utility delivers fault current. The, the transformer will actually reduce the amount of fault current that's a, that, that it passes on to the system. It's a big hunk of iron. Think about that. It's a big hunk of reactants uh, for the power distribution system. What else? Uh, voltages, ratios, all that jazz. The one-line diagram is a wealth of information. It's defined in 70E, a diagram that shows by means of single lines and graphic symbols the course of an electric circuit or system of circuits and the component devices or parts used in the circuit or system. It's an important piece of the puzzle. It's in 70E, it's referenced in 70B for maintenance. It's referenced in the National Electrical Code. And if you wanna calculate fault currents to meet the National Electrical Code or calculate incident energy to get your PPE, you need this document and it better be updated and accurate. You're gonna need software, you'll need a qualified person to understand what they're doing. If you're gonna do calculations, if you're using software, remember, garbage in, garbage out. If you put in bad data, it's gonna give you bad numbers. So you need someone who understands the software that they're using, who understands the, the power distribution system, doesn't necessarily need to be a professional engineer, it needs to be a qualified person. And you're gonna need data, accurate, up-to-date data. All of, those, um, all of that information. Let's do an example of maximum fault current that you could possibly see on the secondary of a 500 kVA transformer, 4160 to 208. And if I'm looking at the secondary, I don't care if it's 4160 on a primary, it could be 480 to 208. It's the 208 number I'm interested in, the kVA that I'm interested in, and the percent impedance. Now the equation to calculate fault current is very simple. Maximum, this, we call this the infinite bus calculation on the secondary of a transformer. I take the full load amps on the secondary of this transformer, multiply it by 100%, 100, and then divide that by the percent impedance, the 3.75. So the first step is to calculate full load amps on the secondary of this transformer. How do I do that? That equation right there. KVA times the square root of three divided by three divided by the KV, 0.208. If I used 208, I've got to multiply the top by 1,000. You may have seen this equation as the KVA times 1,000 divided by the square root of three divided by the voltage. It's just playing with 
the KVs versus volts, the thousands. Or square root of three divided by square root of three is equal to one over the square root of three. So how we, and this is a three phase application too. So 500 KVA times the square root of three divided by three divided by the 0.208 is 1,388 amps for the secondary full load amps of this transformer. To get the maximum available fault current, I just take 1388, multiply that by 100, and divide that by 3.75. And where did the 0.9 come from? 0.9 is, remember, when a transformer impedance, when you see a transformer, its impedance, you multiply it. It can be off by 10% on either end. So to get the maximum available fault current, I reduce the impedance by 10% which is 0.9 times 3.75. And I get 41,126 amps. Now that's a manual calculation. And then you add conductors and you have to do a, uh, it's more of a long and uh, drawn out calculation, but there are tools, free tools that you can download and use to calculate fault current throughout a power distribution system or get an estimate. One of those is the fault current calculator, which I know you've all seen. It's a Busman tool that is free on your iPhone, your Android, or on the web. Google it, look for FC2, go on your Apple phone or your iPhone and search for uh, Busman FC2, fault current, available fault current calculator. You'll find it, download it. This is a, these are screenshots on your typical iPhone. So to model this system, we're going to enter three phase. We're going to say add to the system. We're going to add a transformer to the system. We can add a conductor run. We can add a bus run. We're going to add a transformer. This is when if you have a transformer and you know what the utility's fault current is on the line side of that transformer, you can enter it. If you did a calculation down to the primary of a transformer, you know what that number is. You can take that number and take it on down. I'm going to assume an infinite bus in this application. That's how I did my manual calculation. I put the KVA in and the secondary voltage and the impedance. So 500 KVA, 208 volts, 3.75. There's the minus 10%. Check that box. Hit add to the system. You can add motor contribution or you can say, I don't want motor contribution and we get 41,123 amps. If I compare my manual calculation, I got 41,126, and the, the uh, app got 41,123. The difference is rounding errors in my math. Piece of cake. Now, I mentioned motor contribution. What is motor contribution? If you think about a motor, when you have a short circuit in your system, you're gonna collapse the voltage across the windings. When you collapse the voltage, the rotor is still going to be spinning. It becomes a generator. So when I have a fault, like I show in this system, each of these motors, I have fault current coming from the utility. I have fault current coming from motor, from that motor, from this motor, and that motor. And all of those will add up. And just like electrons are like party animals. They all want to go to the party, and they're lazy. They take the shortest path to the party. The party happens to be the fault. The motor contribution and the utility fault contribution will add to go to the fault current. So you have to understand. You 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 really should, and for other reasons, for in, to understand if you do um, series rated solutions, you'll have to understand the flow of the motor, con the motor contribution with regard to what overcurrent devices are interrupting what currents. The, 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 the circuit breaker, the main circuit breaker in this example does not interrupt the currents that come from this motor because the motor currents will not flow through that main overcurrent device. Only the current coming from the utility will flow through that main overcurrent device. It's an important thing to understand for a lot of different reasons. Series ratings is one of those reasons. Remember in, uh, in the code in 240.86, I'm going to run over to 240.86 real quick. 240.86. 240.86 is 
series ratings, and it'll tell you in 24086.C, motor contribution, the series ratings shall not be used where motor circuits are connected between the high-rated overcurrent device so between the high rated overcurrent device, which is where? Right there. That's the high rated. This would be my 65K interrupting rating of a series rated combination. And on the lower rated, and on the lower rated circuit breaker. So in between those two, so my motor contribution is coming in between that breaker and that breaker. It says the sum of the motor full load currents exceeds 1% of the interrupting rating of the lower rated circuit breaker. So if this is a 10K breaker, my motor full load amps cannot, and I add all of these up, I cannot exceed 1% of the interrupting rating of that overcurrent protective device. So if it's 10,000 amps, 1%, 100 amps. I can't have full load amps exceed 100 amps. Make sense? Because why? The downstream circuit breaker, this guy, this guy right here, will see more current than this guy. When they test series rated pairs, they put two circuit breakers in series, they pass the same amount of current through both of them, and they will both open to stop the flow of that current. In this case, there's more current flowing through the downstream breaker than there is through the upstream breaker. Why do I know that? Because of the path of current that flows in this circuit. So I wanna make sure that my downstream breaker does not see more than 1% of its interrupting rating of full load amps of any motors that are connected in between these two. Short circuit current ratings. So current limitation. I wanna reduce, the, when, I, when I talk about current limiting devices, I wanna reduce the peak. What does that do to a system? When I reduce the peak current, I reduce the magnetic forces and I reduce the, uh, the amount of Magnetic forces and heat that a power distribution system components are seeing, whether it be your terminations, whether it be, whether it be equipment, um, uh, conductors, busway, terminal blocks. If I could, that first half cycle is a doozy. It will do the most damage. It's the rate of change. For a very short period of time, for a very short period of time, here, in that direction, I have a very rapid increase in change of current. During a short circuit current, that first half cycle does a lot of damage. And how we demonstrate this is through what we call the cable whip video. Here's what happens. We take a circuit, we take 90 feet of two aught conductor. You know how stiff two aught conductor is. We pass 26,000 amps through it for one cycle, one cycle. This is the result of one cycle of 26,000 amps of bolted fault through a conductor. One cycle of current all that was one cycle of current that is a lot of magnetic force think about having a circuit breaker upstream that can let 30 cycles of current of up to 100,000 amps through or 90,000 amps or 45,000 amps this is 26,000 amps for one cycle 0 0.016 seconds what we saw was a peak current was 48,100 amps, 15.7 million amps squared second. That's the heat. Remember, the magnetic forces come from that peak current, that rate of change from here to here, and the heat comes from the amps squared seconds, how much time I let flow, and we let one cycle flow. We're going to do the exact same test now. We're going to put a 200-amp 
class RK1 fuse current limiting with 26,000 amps flowing through it, we know we're well into the current limiting region of the fuse. I'm gonna show you the same example. I need you to watch very closely at the tip of the conductor. This demonstrates what current limiting does in reducing the, the force and heat throughout the power distribution system when a device operates in its current limiting region. Here we go. I hope you caught that. I hope you caught that. Very slight movement of the entire conductor. That relieves the pressure off of the system. That's why you can have a disconnect switch that has a 200,000 amp short circuit current rating. Did it actually see 200,000 amps? No. Why? Because the protecting overcurrent protective device cleared it so fast that you did not see the magnetic forces of current because I reduced the peak. That peak let through was only 10.2 kiloamps. I only let through 127,000 amp squared seconds. Very little heat, very little magnetic forces. Understanding your fault currents, understanding the impact of fault currents on the distribution equipment, understanding the impact of having the proper overcurrent protective devices, and applying everything correctly in your power distribution system, they all work together. So, in summary, you need to know your fault current values because it's important for the safe product application. You need to compare, the code tells us, you need to make sure you have the right interrupting ratings, you have the right short circuit current ratings. The code tells you, you even have to mark in some cases, the available fault current on equipment or make it available through documentation. It's important for the system performance. If I'm going to selectively coordinate my system, I need to know my fault currents. If I want to make sure that I receive, I achieve 100,000 or 200,000 amp short circuit current ratings, I need to know I have the right proper interrupting ratings and, and the right overcurrent devices to relieve those pressures of fault currents. I need to know that my, of my ratings of my equipment exceed the available fault current at any one of those locations. And remember, just putting a 200,000 amp fuse at the main does not mean you don't have to worry about fault current throughout the entire distribution system. At every point, everywhere where you apply a piece of equipment, you need to make sure the short circuit current rating is greater than the available fault current at that, at that point in the power distribution system, regardless, regardless of where it's at in the power system. You don't just rely on one device upstream to knock down your current everywhere. Every piece of equipment, every component, every overcurrent device has to be evaluated against its available fault current at where it's applied in the power distribution system. Else you have an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. Important for power system studies, selective coordination, incident energy. I can't calculate incident energy if I don't know my fault current. I can't calculate my fault current if I don't have an accurate one-line diagram, please don't forget about the one-line diagram. And if I want to do my equipment evaluations, it all has to be accurate and up-to-date. That's a one-hour overview. That's a one-hour and 12-minute overview of available fault current. You, you saw the sections in the code that are required for marking the fault current, required for marking SCCR everywhere. Any device you apply in any portion of the power distribution system because of 110.10 tells you you need to make sure that the short circuit current rating is greater than the available fault current at that location. You're not going to get away with not calculating. Now, you may be able to say, look, my equipment is 10,000 amps. I looked at the size of my transformer and the impedance. The maximum fault current that that transformer can put through is only 9,000 amps, and everything downstream is rated 10,000. Do you need to do any more math? No, you don't. If you do, if you calculate the secondary of your uh, transformer and it's uh, 50,000 amps of available fault current and everything downstream is rated 65K, you're done. So, but you need to know and ascertain the available fault currents. You also need to know how to estimate these numbers to make sure that when an overcurrent device interrupts current, what was the magnitude? 
Don't forget that Busman FC2, Eaton's Busman's FC2 calculator. You may have other tools from other resources, but uh, that app is very popular, uh, used by many in the industry, and it can help you quite easily ascertain a maximum number that uh, you can use to compare for interrupting ratings, short circuit current ratings, and meet the National Logical Code. It'll even, it'll even give you a label. And it's free. That's the best part. It's a free download. Well, hopefully I will see all of you at one of the section meetings. I'm not going to them all. Uh, hopefully you will see each other. Share information, share ideas, share your concepts, your dreams of increasing electrical safety in the industry. You and I can make a difference. We are making a difference. We can do it together. Thanks for taking time out of your day for this IAEI News Live event. Catch us every Tuesday at 12. This was pre-recorded. Catch us next Tuesday. You might catch us live, and you never know who's going to be on the program. So, uh, do you have ideas for topics for the future? Please shoot them over to me. Let me know. Contact the IAEI. Let them know. And we'll get your topic on the schedule and find the industry expert who is ready to help us understand any technical topic you need discussed. Thank you very much. Thanks for what you do for the electrical industry. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. Remember to be safe and please stay healthy. Until next Tuesday. Take care, God bless, and stay safe.